Ross Baton is a horticulturist, author, and freelance editor. He has served as a volunteer at the UW Botanic Gardens and the Center for Urban Horticulture, where he has audited a database of over 23,000 herbarium spe specimens and worked to collect over 1,800 horticultural new specimens. He is the author of Plant Families, a guide for gardeners and botanists, Genealogy for Gardeners, Plant Families Explained and Explored, RHS Gardening School, Everything You Need to Know to Garden Like a Professional, and RHS Color Companion, a visual dictionary of color for gardeners. Maiden is also a taxonomist and teacher of botany classes and informative plant talks at Ursonwood Garden, a unique horticultural facility run by the Port Gamble Scalum Tribe. Baton's new book, The Gardener's Botanical, an encyclopedia of Latin plant names with more than 5,000 entries, is the subject of tonight's talk. Please join me in welcoming Ross Baton. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming in. Um, if anybody has any queries about my outlandish accent, um, I'm from Scotland. And if you need me to say anything again because you didn't understand it the first time, then please do shout out. So, the Gardener's Botanical. The Gardener's Botanical was an opportunity for me to help gardeners understand botanical Latin. And botanical Latin often confuses gardeners. And when you speak to them, they say, uh, I can't spell the words, I can't pronounce them, um, even I just can't remember them. And I find that the best way of being able to remember and to pronounce words that you don't understand is to know what they mean. And so this volume includes 5,000 different uh, botanical Latin words with their meaning and their derivation. Uh, I hope that by reading it and understanding what these words mean, um, it'll be easier for you to use them in future um, and that you'll feel more comfortable using them when discussing your garden. Also, the uh, Latin name of a plant is the key to being able to care for the plant. If you want to find out any information about a plant, then obviously what do you do? You look in a book or you Google it. If you Google the English name, you'll find all sorts of different things, because unfortunately, a lot of plants have multiple different English names, but they should only have one Latin name, and that Latin name will clue you in to um, a variety of different information about the plant, how you care for it, where it comes from, and other really useful information. Also, a lot of plant botanical names have stories behind them, stories of botanical exploration, of taxonomists and horticulturalists and gardeners traveling around the world looking for new plants. And understanding what plant Latin names mean um, can sometimes reveal some very, very interesting stories. So I, I thought I would start by talking about uh, why we use Latin. Why Latin? Why not English? Well. For a start, nobody speaks Latin, and that's kind of handy because it means that um, if we're looking for a language that can be used internationally, that anyone, anybody can use, there's no favoritism because nobody speaks Latin. <laughs> also though, from a traditional perspective, um, scientists and scholars have been using Latin to describe the world in which we live for centuries. If you were a student at a university in the 17th or 18th centuries, you would have been taught in Latin. You would have taken all your classes in Latin, you would have written in Latin, and everything you read would have been in Latin. Universities in those days partly felt that learning Latin and being able to speak and understand Latin was a really good way of inducing nimbleness of mind in their students. But also, um, when you think back to those periods, all church services were conducted in Latin, as some of them still are today. And the church was a, a, a font of knowledge, and a lot of the people who studied plants and their uh, science were actually uh, priests and uh, medical men as well. So Latin has always been an important component of science, and you will find it in all different uh, parts of science. So for example, the Northern Lights are Aurora Borealis, which literally translates as Northern Lights. If you were in the Southern Hemisphere, the lights you would see in the sky are called Aurora Australis, the Southern Lights. And this is not the only term in uh, meteorology that uses uh, a, a Latin base. Just think of all the different names of different cloud formations, like Cirrus and Cumulonimbus. They're all in Latin too. 
Meteorology is not the only branch of science that uses Latin. Um, astronomy, too, is rich in Latin terms. So this uh, constellation that we refer to as the Big Dipper in Latin is Ursa Major, the Great Bear, which is a literal translation of uh, what it was originally thought to look like. Of course, it's in the biological sciences that Latin has become so crucial, not just with plants, whether you're an animal or an amoeba, uh, a bacteria or a virus, uh, a human or a plant, you will have a Latin name. And here's ours, Homo sapiens, which means wise man. So we're obviously quite modest. <laughs> All living things have Latin names, and those Latin names enable scientists in different countries to communicate with one another. They may not be specialists in the naming of plants, they may be ecologists, conservationists, they may be government bodies that are charged with looking after plants, they will always use the Latin name because it's the only unifying name that will apply wherever you are. And in day-to-day -day use, um, you will find that Latin can actually be kind of useful. So this is a bottle of shower gel. It claims to be soft and silky, coconut and orchid. And if you look at the label on the back, you'll find that the Latin names appear in the label. So there we have Buterospermum parki, shea butter, Theobroma cacao, chocolate, Simonsia chinensis, jojoba, Cocos nucifera. So there's the coconut that it claims on the label. And there's the orchid, Orchis mascula. Producers of uh, cosmetics are obligated by law to list the ingredients that should be contained within. And if they contain plant products, then they will always have the plant's Latin name. In this case, they've put the English names too, but they are not required. So Latin is still important in the production of a wide range of different products. Now, any taxonomist, and a taxonomist is a person who uh, names, describes, and classifies plants. Anybody talking about taxonomy always puts a picture of this guy up. So this is Carl von Linné. He was a Swedish medical doctor. Um, like many medical doctors in his day, he didn't just work with uh, human patients. He was, had a wide and broad interest, plants, animals. He was brought specimens by sailors, by explorers, and he attempted to classify them. Um, he was from Sweden, and he's generally better known by his Latin name. So he has a Latin name too. He's Carolus Linnaeus. And Linnaeus is widely considered to be the father of plant taxonomy. Now, I put a picture of a plant next to him. This is twin flower, which you may have found or encountered in the mountains of Washington. It's a native plant here. It's called twin flower because each stalk has a little pair of flowers there. Now, Twin flower was Linnaeus' favorite plant, and it also occurs in Sweden, where he was from. And as you can see, whenever you see him in a portrait, he always has a little sprig of twin flower in his lapel. He liked the plant so much that he had it incorporated into his coat of arms. And indeed, today, it is named after him. It is Linnaea borealis. Now, what did Linnaeus do that led to him having such a uh, stellar reputation. Well, his system of classification is ignored these days. It's really, out, it's, uh, and it didn't last for very long either. It's, um, though he thought it was a very good system, many of the taxonomists that followed him did not agree. But there was something he did do for us. Um, and I've put up a page here from one of his works. You can see it was quite an exciting uh, volume. <laughs> this is Species Plantarum from 1753. This book is very important if you work in the classification of plants because this is the beginning. Now, people have been classifying plants way back into the early days of time, but for plant uh, taxonomists, we have to have a beginning date, and this is it. All plant classification began in 1753 with this work, Species Plantarum. Now, it's a fairly dry tome. It's basically just a list of plants and how he classified them, but he did something that, uh, that would be revolutionary and that we still use today. So I'm going to run you through a couple of them. So up here, here is Linnea that we've just looked at, and he describes it, Linnea floribus geminatis, which means Linnea with twin flowers. Geminatis coming from the same root as the word Gemini, the twins that we see in uh, astronomy. Now, that's a bit cumbersome. It's a description, but prior to Linnaeus, 
all plants and animals were known by a brief description. So if you look at the plant below, we have one here, Sibthorpia folius reniformis subpeltatus crenatus. That was its name. Obviously, that's very cumbersome. What it means is uh, Sibthorpia with foliage, which is reniform or kidney-shaped, or subpeltate, which means uh, roughly shield-shaped, and that the edges of the leaves are crenate, which means they have rounded teeth. Now, it's a good description. It describes exactly what Sibthorpia looks like, but it's really difficult to use if you're just in normal conversation trying to talk about a plant. It's cumbersome. Now, what Linnaeus did was at the end of each of these sentences, he put a second word, borealis, <coughs> europea. He had come up with a system whereby every plant had two names. And today we refer to those two names as the Linnaean binomial in honor of Linnaeus. So here is a binomial. This is Linnea borealis. And the first bit, this bit here, which is obviously named after Linnaeus, we call this the genus or the generic name. And generic names kind of work a bit like our surname or family name. You can have several members of the genus Linnaeus, uh, Linnaea. The second word, borealis, that is the species name or specific epithet. And what that does is it, quant it quant uh, quantifies the previous name. It describes it. So this is the Linnaea from the north, the boreal Linnaea. Now, all plant names have these two parts, genus and species. And I'm going to go through a lot of different plant names as I'm up here talking, but it's really important that you know that that's kind of the format for all plant names. In fact, it's the format for all names of all living things, animals as well as plants. So my book is called The Gardener's Botanical Encyclopedia of Latin Plant Names. But guess what? Most of them aren't Latin. They are Greek. <laughs> if, as I was going through these 5,000 different names, I discovered that a good, a good number of them are actually directly derived from Greek. And the reason for that is that some scholars working in earlier centuries had great reverence for the works of the classical authors. Publications from ancient Greece and from Rome were still considered modern and important. And what a lot of uh, classification experts would do is that they would read through these books and take names that were in them and apply them to modern plants. And that's exactly what happened in this case. So this is a cactus. Um, this is a cactus called Opuntia megacantha. Now, megacantha means big spine which seems kind of legitimate for a cactus. But this cactus comes from the New World. In fact, almost all cacti only live in the New World, okay? But the name, Opuntia, means spiny plant from the city of Opus in Greece. These cacti don't occur in Greece, or at least they don't now. Uh, they didn't back then. They don't naturally occur in Greece. But what happened was some author reading through classical texts found this name, the name of a spiny plant from Greece. They didn't know what plant it was, but they thought, that's a good name. I'm going to take that. And that is now the name of all the prickly pear cacti that we have here in the Americas. So, Opuntia from the city of Opus. So, while we call them Latin names and we call the language botanical Latin, a lot of it has origins in other languages, particularly Greek. And in cases where they have taken the language from Greek, they have Latinized it. So they've transformed it partly for spelling purposes and partly so that it works in the uh, Latin scheme. So obviously, when you have a, a situation like this where somebody comes and talks to you about the book that they've written, normally they stand there and they read parts of the book. This is an encyclopedia. That didn't seem like the best option for today. It seemed a little dry. So what I'm going to do is I am going to go through the different types of names that are uh, given to plants and explain the differences between them and give you a few good examples. Really, all I wanted to do was give you lots of pretty pictures of plants. So Now, of the 5,000 names in this book, the most common type are descriptive names that describe some kind of element of the plant, what it looks like, where it comes from, they are by far the most common. And to my mind, they're also the most useful. They tell you useful things about the plant, what it looks like or what it does. Um, also, they're not political. We'll get on to politics in a second. So, descriptive plant names. This plant here is the false Solomon seal, again, another Washington State native plant, um, and its Latin name, Myanthemum dilatatum. 
and myanthemum dilatatum means may flower that spreads. So anthemos is the Greek for flower, Maya, the month of May, and dilatata means to spread. And as you can see, this plant really does spread. If you have this plant in your garden, you will never be able to get rid of it, delightful as it is. And indeed, it does also flower in spring, usually around the month of May. So this name is entirely descriptive. Whoever, whichever taxonomist gave this name, all they did was they described the plant that was in front of them. And that's kind of useful. It, it's easy to match up the name and the plant when the, the name describes the plant. And here's another one, Rhododendron barbatum. Now, everybody's heard of Rhododendron. Rhododendron means rose tree, and it's one of those many Latin names that is actually Greek. So, rhodos meaning rose, dendron meaning tree, and presumably was given because some of the early species of Rhododendron that were found had pink or reddish flowers. Barbatum means bearded, and the bearded uh, Rhododendron gets its name because in here, amongst the flower clusters, you will find some little hairs. So in this case, the taxonomist looked for a specific characteristic, and there are a lot of rhododendrons. So it can be pretty tricky to find something to describe, but in this case, they found a few hairs, and so they called it the bearded rhododendron, rhododendron barbatum. Now, Latin names don't always necessarily describe the exact physical characters of the plant. This plant here is widely known in English as bloodroot. When you cut open the roots, you get a bright red uh, uh, liquid sap that is vaguely resembling blood. And that's where the Latin name comes from, too. So, sanguinaria, from sanguine, the Latin for blood. Um, you'll notice it's sanguinaria canadensis. And any name that ends in ensis usually refers to geography. Um, in this case, of course, canadensis suggests that it came from Canada. But actually, this plant can be found from southern Canada all the way down to Florida. And Canada was often used as a catch-all term for North America before Canada and the United States existed as separate countries. So a lot of the plant names have canadensis in them, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they are restricted to the modern-day uh, borders of Canada. You'll find um, a lot, another very common one is Virginiana doesn't mean it just came from Virginia, and in many cases they have much wider spread, but because colonists arrived in Virginia first, those were the first plants that they uh, began to name. Now, this plant's description is slightly different. Palustris means of the marsh. Now, that's telling you something very useful. This plant in English is known as bog buttercup, and it really needs to have its roots in water. This plant will not tolerate dry conditions. And so knowing that it has the name Palustris tells you something useful as a gardener. And names like Palustris are not uncommon. So there's Sylvestris of the forest, um, Rivali of the river, uh, Arvensi of the field, and Montana of the mountains. Names like that are giving you a clue as to where the plant comes from. And if you know where a plant comes from, you're going to be better equipped to give it the care that it needs. This first bit here, Caltha, means goblet. And that's because when the flower first opens, it looks like a little cup. So again, it's a purely uh, descriptive name. This is Hepatica nobilis. And Hepatica comes from the Latin word for the liver. And if you look at the leaves, if you look at their kind of big lobes like this, they look vaguely like the human liver. And early physicians and herbalists had this idea that God would help them to decide which plants were good to use on their patients by making a part of the plant look like the part of the body that it was going to help. So this they called liverwort, and it was meant to cure the liver. There's pulmonaria, lungwort, to cure the lungs, and aristolochia, birthwort, for gynecological purposes, euphrasia, eyewort, to cure conditions of the eyes. And this theory of how God sent messages to Earth was called the Doctrine of Signatures, and it was very, very widely believed by herbalists for a long period of time, despite the fact that a lot of these plants either did no curative uh, properties for the disease in question or actually were poisonous and could actually kill the people. <laughs> so, Hepatica gets its name from its liver-shaped uh, foliage. Nobilis just means noble, and generally the name Nobilis is given to plants if they're particularly special looking. Um, in this case, it's because of the very pretty mottling on the color of, on the uh, tops of the leaves. Now, Latin names aren't always correct, alas. 
This is Scylla peruviana. Now, Scylla just means squill, which is the common name for the plant. But what do you think Peruviana would mean? Well, most people would assume it meant that this plant comes from Peru. It doesn't. It comes from the Mediterranean. Now, Linnaeus named this plant, and it appears that when he received it, he got a little note with it saying Peru. And so he assumed, of course, that this plant came from Peru, when actually the plant had been shipped to him from the Mediterranean on the SS Peru. <laughs> Now, you may wonder why this plant is still called Scylla Peruviana. Well, once you've given a plant its name, as long as you've published that name correctly, that is its name, and you can't change it, even if the description is slightly incorrect. So this plant is forevermore known as Peruvian squill, even though it has never set foot in Peru. So descriptive plant names are useful. They can provide uh, useful information for gardeners and for those interested in plants, if you don't mind the occasional red herring. Now, the second most common type of plant names are the commemorative ones, and this is where botanists get into slightly more tricky waters. Commemorative names um, are not quite as useful to us as gardeners, because they don't really tell you anything about how you grow the plant or where it came from. But sometimes they have kind of interesting stories attached to them. Why did that particular person choose to honor somebody or, somebody, or, or something? And so I have a few here to uh, show you that will have interesting stories behind them. And being British, I had to start with the plant named after Queen Victoria. This is the giant water lily from South America. And it was named after Queen Victoria not long after her coronation. The naming of plants after royalty and members of the aristocracy was pretty common, partly as a way of currying favor, but also because often members of the aristocracy were the only ones who could afford to sponsor collection work in far-flung places. They would send their gardeners, they would send uh, interested people to other parts of the world and have them bring plants back. And so in honor of them, plants were named uh, as this. Um, today, what you tend to find is that plants get uh, named after people who are actually working on them. So they're more often named after botanists or local collectors it's considered more appropriate to name them after somebody who has a, an actual connection with them. But it's not always the case. Um, a species of palm uh, from Madagascar is called Dipsis mcdonaldiana, and it is named after the golden arches. As they sponsored the collection work that allowed people to first pick the plant up in Madagascar. This is Victoria Cruziana, and Cruziana honors Andre de Santa Cruz. Now, Andre de Santa Cruz was a president of Peru, he was then later a president of Bolivia, and he sponsored the field trip when this uh, water lily was first collected in Bolivia. So it seems, it seems uh, legitimate that it should be named in his honor. Of course, not to be outdone, you Americans also have some uh, plants named after important people in your history. This is the Mexican fan palm, Washingtonia robusta, named after President Washington. Um, politicians are not often honored in such a way. I'm not sure why. <laughs> the, historically, politicians were honored because they perhaps contributed towards a, a, a trip or because they had some involvement in the politics of the country in which the plant was collected. Today, it's more likely the absolute reverse where people name plants or animals in honor of someone to kind of take the mickey out of them. They'll find the ugliest bug or a, <laughs> a parasitic wasp and they'll name it after the current president depending on their <laughs> politics. This one is interesting because Washingtonia has two species. One, this one, is native to Mexico, and the other is native to California, Arizona, and just into Mexico. It's the palm after which Palm Springs and so many other cities in uh, California are named. And it's called Washingtonia filifera. Now, filifera means thread-bearing because the threads from the leaves are used in weaving. And if you bring these two palms together, they kind of get jiggy, and you can, uh, they can crossbreed, producing a fertile hybrid. Now, that hybrid, its name is derived from the two parents, so from Washingtonia robusta and Washingtonia filifera, we get Washingtonia filibuster. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems like an appropriate name for any plant that's named after a politician. Now, some plants that are named after people, you don't even realize that they're named after people. 
This is a magnolia. I'm sure almost everybody in the room has heard of a magnolia before, but did anyone realize that magnolia is actually named after a person? You think of magnolia, you think of the suburb of Seattle. Um, if you're like me and you're from the UK, you think of paint, because the most common color of paint painted on walls in the UK is a kind of white with pink hint called magnolia. But magnolia honors a French botanist called Pierre Magnol. And Pierre Magnol is most famous because he created the plant family, which is a unit of taxonomy that we still use today. But almost nobody has ever heard of him, despite the fact that most people have heard of magnolia. In this case, this is Magnolia Campbelli, and Campbelli honors um, Archibald Campbell, who was the superintendent of the city of Darjeeling in northern India, where the plant was uh, first collected. And unfortunately, or, or otherwise, it's not uncommon for plants to be named after people who have history in colonial government. They were the people who traveled and brought these plant materials back to Europe, where they were then named, uh, as in this case. Camellia. Another one probably everybody has heard of that is also named after a person. In this case, it was Georg Joseph Camel, with a K. And Camel was a priest and botanist from what is now the Czech Republic. So every time you look at a camellia, try and remember uh, Georg Camel, because nobody ever remembers who he is. <laughs> camellia and magnolia have become so much associated with their plants that they've become the English name for them. We don't really have a common name for this other than it's a camellia. And you'll find the same with azalea and rhododendron and magnolia. We've forgotten the history behind them. But it is important that these people are remembered. Having gone through 5,000 plant names, one thing I can tell you is there is a definite paucity of women being honored in plant Latin names. Now, we did see Queen Victoria, and a lot of the uh, plants that are named after women are either named after aristocrats or they're named after the wives of botanists. There are a lot of plants named after the wives of botanists. But here are two that are not. These two both commemorate female botanists. On the left, we have Libertia grandiflora. It's an iris relative from New Zealand. And it names and commemorates Marie Libert, a Belgian botanist. On the right, we have Nyphophia northiae. Now, Nyphophia names uh, honors a German male botanist, so we're not really interested. Um, but Northia honors Marianne North. Now, Marianne North was an artist, a collector, a, bo a botanist and biologist um, during the Victorian period. She traveled very widely, uh, and in those days, it wasn't that common for women to travel widely and to collect. She painted many of the plants that she saw, and her collections and paintings were often the first image that anybody had ever had of uh, entirely new species. In fact, there's a whole gallery dedicated to her honor at the Royal Botanic Gardens Kew in, in England, uh, the Marianne North Gallery. Now, one thing to note is you can maybe see there Northier, I-A-E. That tells you that it's named after a woman. If this had been named after a man called North, it would end I-I. So if you're ever looking for a, a female name. So, commemorative names. They are interesting and they have fascinating stories, but they're less useful. Um, and more often than not, they honor people who um, took a plant and took it away from its country of origin and took it away to Europe or North America. Local language names are increasingly rare in uh, plant botany. So, they always tended to be in colonial times a bit of a dismissal of the names of uh, plants that were given to them by the people who lived in the countries where they occur. Um, a few of them survive, and more and more often botanists are adopting the local name for a plant and Latinizing it so that it can then continue to be the formal name for a plant. So I thought I would start here. This is Quercus robur, the English oak. Um, why the English oak? Well, Quercus is the Roman name for oak. So a lot of trees that were present in the Mediterranean area and in Italy specifically, of course they had names in Latin because that's where the Romans lived and they had a name for these plants and so their name has often been adopted as the, the Latin name for the plant. So Quercus is the Roman name for oak. Malus is the Roman name for apple. And Pinus is the Roman name for pine. Now, there's a kind of an interesting factoid here about uh, Latin names that were adopted by the Romans, um, and that is that they get their genders mixed up. So if any of you have studied Italian, French, Spanish, or uh, Portuguese, 
any language that is derived from Latin, you'll know that one of the concepts you have to learn is gender. Every, every noun has a gender. Is it masculine, feminine, or neuter? And that's important because any word that follows it then has to agree with it. So you have um, flora hermosa, beautiful flower, and both of them end in A because both of them are feminine. Well, the same is true with plant names. Because they are based on Latin, the genus and the species have to agree with one another. Now, pinus ends in US, and that generally would mean that they are masculine, that it's a masculine name. But this plant, this is, I'm sorry, you can't see the end there. This is Pinus monophylla, which ends in an A, which is a feminine name. So why is that? Have they broken the rules? Well, the Romans had this thing whereby any tree, but particularly those that provided a food or, or fruit, they, can, they gave them a masculine name, but they considered them feminine because they birthed fruits or useful products. So oak, apple, pine, fig, um, the grapevine, they all have masculine sounding names, but they are treated as being feminine because of one of the quirks of um, ancient Rome. Now, this isn't a Roman name. This name, Luma Apiculata, is a Mapuche name. Now, Mapuche is one of the indigenous languages of Chile. And a number of plants from Chile are still known today by their pre-conquest names um, and are uh, converted, basically, into Latin names. So Luma is the name that is used locally for this particular member of the Myrtle family. This plant is Japanese, and it also has a Japanese name. Its, a, its Latin name is based on three Japanese words, and I know there are Japanese speakers in the audience, so I'm likely to uh, massacre these names, and I'm sure um, Nile will correct me. But Ki, which means yellow, Renge, which means lotus blossom, and shoma, which means hat. So this is the yellow hat flower. And it's a pretty good name for it. If you, with a bit of artistic license, those uh, flowers could be interpreted as being hat-like. And there are a number of uh, plant names like uh, Tanakia, Fatsia, and Orcuba that are of Japanese origin. Now, this plant comes from South America. And I don't know if you've ever heard of a foodstuff called cassava. Now, cassava is not very common here, um, mainly because it needs tropical climate to thrive. And if you go to any tropical country, you'll find that cassava is a really important staple food, uh, food crop. This plant gets its name Manihot from Brazil, and it's the an indigenous name from one of the many indigenous languages in Brazil for cassava. So the cassava genus Manihot is a native name for cassava. This particular species is Maniot carthaginensis, and carthaginensis means from Cartagena. Cartagena is a city and region in Colombia. This plant's probably a bit more familiar to you. This is the Joshua tree, which you'll find in several parts of southwestern United States. And it's one of very few Latin names that begins with a Y. Y was not part of the Latin alphabet. But when the Romans conquered Greece, they started to adopt a number of words that were common in the Greek language. And some of those languages, some of those words required a letter like the letter Y. And so when you find Y in Latin, it generally indicates a word that is not of uh, Roman Latin origin. In this case, yuca is a word from the Caribbean. And funnily enough, it also means cassava. In a number of Caribbean islands, yuca is the word they use for edible cassava. And when Columbus and others arrived in the Caribbean, they adopted that word too. But why apply it to this plant? Well, some species of yucca have edible roots. The plant is not related to cassava in any kind of way. They're completely different. But because it also has edible roots, this name was adopted for them and has become the Latin name for them, yucca from yuca. Joshua Tree does not have edible roots, by the way. So once you move out of the realms of uh, uh, local languages, another big area that has uh, generated a lot of interesting plant names is mythology. And early plant taxonomists were very interested in the works of classical scholars from Greece and Rome. And so you will find a lot of names from Greek and Roman mythology uh, in plant Latin names. So, for example, Heracleum lanatum, named after Hercules or Heracles. 
Why would this plant be named after Hercules? Well, this is a member of the carrot family, and members of the carrot family are usually fairly small, herbaceous plants, but this plant can be taller than me. So it's a, it's a giant among its family, and therefore honored, uh, honors Hercules. Um, here's another one that has a, a mythological link. This plant, which is found on beaches from British Columbia all the way down to California, is called ambrosia. And ambrosia in Greek mythology is the food of the gods. The gods, sitting on their clouds, they would consume uh, ambrosia and they would drink nectar, the drink of the gods. What is really unclear is why this plant is called ambrosia. This is, this is a group of plants that are incredibly weedy. Um, they are of no particular use, they're not consumed. And the person who first called them ambrosia didn't explain why they chose that name. So we don't really know. We know what ambrosia is, but this plant certainly is not it. <laughs> now, this is a plant that is very, very tiny, only a few inches tall, but it gets its name from some, uh, from some very tall trees. Um, dryas. Now, dryas is named after the dryads, and dryads were wood nymphs. And not just any wood nymphs, but they were specifically wood nymphs that lived in oak trees. So it was thought that these creatures lived in oak trees, and anything that was associated with oak was often given the name dryas. And it's from the Greek word for oak. We spoke earlier about how Quercus is the Latin name for oak. Well, dry is the Greek word for oak. And the reason they get that name is because their leaf is roughly the shape of an oak leaf. It's not much bigger than my finger, but it looks vaguely like an oak. Um, now, this is Dryas octopetala, and octopetala means eight petals. If you count them, you'll find this plant has seven. <laughs> mm. Now, everybody knows daffodils, and everybody probably knows that they are called Narcissus in Latin. And most people think that the name comes from the uh, story of Narcissus, who was a hunter in Greek mythology. He was said to be dashing and rather handsome, and one day, whilst hunting in the woods, <coughs> He found himself next to a pool of water. He looked down and he saw his reflection and he was amazed, he was bedazzled. So much so that he just couldn't leave. Whenever he tried to turn away, he just couldn't bear not to see his own reflection. Which is of course where we get the word narcissist. But is the daffodil named after him? Well, the story goes that he was rooted to the spot and stayed next to his pool and so the gods turned him into a flower. So maybe the flower was a daffodil, right? Well, there's no evidence for that, and the original stories don't really mention what kind of flower Narcissus was turned into. And it may well be that Narcissus has a different origin um, in the Greek word narkau. Now, narkau, which is also where we get the word narcotic, means I grow weak. And I grow weak, perhaps, because many species of daffodil have quite a strong fragrance an intoxicating fragrance that makes you feel weak in the same way that a narcotic drug would. And it may be that that is the origin of the word narcissus, but we will never be sure. Now, we've wandered through the realms of Roman and Greek mythology, but it's not just uh, that source that provides plant names. This is the orchid, Dracula Bella. Now, why is it named after a Transylvanian count? Well, it has kind of a slightly creepy appearance, it has, uh, species of Dracula have black or brown or dark colored flowers. They even seem to have fangs on the corners of the petals. But it's got, nothing to do with, uh, it's got nothing to do with Dracula or with vampires. And yes, this orchid does come from South America where vampires come from, but again, that's not the connection. Um, these flowers attract fungus gnats, and fungus gnats are insects that feed on fungi. And one of the things that tra attracts them is the dark color and the pungent smell, but also this white petal in the center here, which looks remarkably like a mushroom. By drawing these insects into their flowers, they then are, uh, the flowers are fertilized, they are pollinated, um, and then can develop their seed. And it's a bit of trickery. They are able to get these uh, insects to do the job for free. They don't have to provide any, any, any nectar or any pollen, they, pr they uh, simply trick the insect into coming to them thinking that it's their usual habitat. That's why they have the name Dracula, because they're dark. <laughs> now, plant, uh, people who work in plant classification are uh, busy people. They have lots of plants to name, and sometimes they kind of take shortcuts when trying to create a new name.
Um, a lot of names come from expedience. When you have a lot of plants to name, you will sometimes reuse the old name. So, for example, earlier we looked at the Opuntia, the prickly pear cactus. Well, this is Cylindropuntia. What they've done is they've taken Opuntia, which is a cactus with pad-shaped stems, and they've added the word cylindro, meaning cylindrical, because this cactus has cylindrical stems. Cylindropuntia, they've cheated. But the great thing about this bit of cheating is that it also tells you that these two plants are related. Opuntia and Cylindropuntia are indeed closely related cacti. And this one, Cylindropuntia, is the cactus that is known as a choya in the southwest of the US. Here's another cactus where they've cheated. On the left, we have Cereus, and Cereus means candle or torch in Latin. And if you look at the plant, it's vaguely column-shaped like a candle, and it's covered in a kind of bluish-white wax. Next to it, we have Pachycereus. They've cheated again. They've taken one name that already existed, and they've added a bit on the front. Pachy means thick. So this is the thick candle. And indeed, it's a much more uh, robust plant. Cactus taxonomists are not the only ones to cheat. These two palms are both native to Florida. On the left, we have Thrinax, and Thrinax has the same origin as the word trident, and it refers to the kind of spiky texture of the leaves. Next to it is its close relative, Leucothrinax, and leuco means white or pale, and it gets its name because its leaves are much paler on the underside, so if you're trying to distinguish between the two, the one with the pale foliage is the Leucothrinax. Now, chopping and changing names is not the only way of cheating. Um, this plant here is called Asarum, and Asarum is a bit of a mystery name. Um, we know it's derived from Greek. Um, we know Asaron means a plant, but we have no idea what plant it is. We have no idea what it looked, looked like. We just know that in some uh, piece of Greek literature, Asaron was a plant that was mentioned, and somebody then adopted that to become the Latin name of wild ginger. Um, but wild ginger um, has a close relation from China that has much more colorful flowers than these rather brown-looking ones, and here it is. This is Saruma. Now, Saruma and Asarum are very close relations. They are also anagrams. So <laughs> juggle the letters of Asarum, and you get Saruma. That's a good cheat, right? It's not the only one. Here are two uh, Washington State natives, Telema and Mytella. Again, they're both anagrams. Anagrams are really a fun way of uh, creating a new name, but also implying a relationship. And this is not the only way that uh, taxonomists will do this. So, for example, um, there is a cactus genus from South America called Libivia, which is an anagram of Bolivia, where it comes from. And there's another called Denmosa. And Denmosa is an anagram of Mendoza, which is the province in Argentina where the cactus comes from. So, Plant taxonomists are not above cheating when it comes to finding a new name, and because you can't reuse a name that's already been used, you're kind of obliged to always come up with something new. And with uh, DNA and new uh, advances in plant taxonomy coming along, there's been a need for new names and for more names. And so uh, taxonomists are having to be creative. So that's my little run through the different kinds of plant names that um, are uh, used by plant taxonomists. Um, understanding plant Latin names is very useful if you're a gardener. Not only will it help you to remember them and to pronounce them, but it will give you information that will be useful to you when you uh, are gardening. But plant taxonomy also provides a range of exciting and interesting stories. Um, it helps to explain the history of science and exploration. Um, and uh, the book that uh, I have here, I can hold it up now, ta-da! Yes, it's an encyclopedia, but there is a ton of information there, and I really hope that you get a book and that you enjoy it and that you find out some fascinating things about plants that you did not know before. Now, does anybody have any questions? Thank you. That was very informative. Um, in plant catalogs, they, they do list genus and species, but then when they get into all this hybridizing and cross, and are there some simple clues for deciphering some of that information? Or is that another book? 
I hope so. Um, <laughs> actually, as long as you know the genus and species, you're pretty much there already. All of the rest is supplemental information, and it's just adding to what you already know. Um, generally, in seed catalogs and in uh, websites that for places where they're selling plants, the thing that you will see will actually be in English. It'll be what we call a cultivar. It'll mm -hmm. generally be in inverted commas, and it'll not be in Latin. It'll be in any other language but Latin, but generally English. And what that is, is a selection. Somebody has chosen a form of the plant that was particularly good, and they've given it a name. So that's additional information to what you're getting from the Latin. So it's important that you know the Latin, but it's not too confusing because the any of the additional names are generally in a language that you will understand. All these things are just selections that have been chosen for a particular uh, good quality, whether it's a good tasting vegetable or a particularly fine flower, that kind of thing. Yeah, okay, thank you. You're welcome. Just a quick question. When they do the anagrams and so forth, how then, unless you're looking at a pictorial, do you know that they're necessarily related? There has to be some route that will lead you to... Mm -hmm. Thankfully, there are not that many anagrams, so it's not an issue that you're going to have, have to come across all that often. And if things are related, you'll often see that they've just used the same name and added a, a suffix or a prefix or something like that, as in the case of the cacti and the palms. Um, because there are so few anagrams, I just tend to remember them. There isn't, a, there isn't a key there, there isn't a trick, but generally they are given to plants that are related, and once you realize that they are anagrams, you then know, you see the, uh, the, the relationship. I've been looking at, at the Latin names for years, ever since mm -hmm. Culpepper's herbal, right? Mm -hmm. But never made the connection about the anagram, so I was wondering how that would tie in, so if you were looking for something specific. Alas, right there's no trick, but um, anagrams are funny things. My own surname is an anagram of botany, so. <laughs> mm. You said that each of these plants just has the two names, but if I look in older books, mm -hmm. I find a lot of different names. Mm -hmm. How do we know what's in use currently? It's a difficult one, so let me give you an example. Um, a botanist is working in Alaska, and they find a plant that they think is new, so they give it a new name. Say it's a pine tree, and they call it Pinus alaskensis, because they found it in Alaska. Meanwhile, across the Bering Strait in eastern Russia, a botanist has found a pine tree that he doesn't recognize, and so he gives it a new name and calls it Pinus siberica, the pine from Siberia. But they're the same plants, because plants don't recognize uh, geogra uh, political boundaries. Um, and maybe at the time, the Russian botanist and the American botanist just weren't talking to each other. Fancy. <laughs> um, what then happens is, when somebody starts to look at the plants over a much wider range, they then see these two plants with these two different names and realize that they're the same thing. What do they do? Well, what happens is one of those names becomes what we know as a, what we call a synonym. One of the names goes out of use, and one of the names becomes the correct name for the plant in both places. How do we decide which? It's entirely down to the date, the date that the pet names were published. So if the Russian guy published his first, it becomes Pinus siberica. If the American got there first, it's Pinus alaskensis. And that's why Linnaeus's 1753 is really important. Because if you can keep going back to older and older and older names, when do you stop? Well, you stop in 1753. That's when it begins. Um, as for um, some plants can have an incredibly large list of synonyms, and what that will often reflect is poor knowledge of the plant across its whole range. So for example, there's a, a palm that occurs in Africa that has over 50 synonyms. And the reason for that was that people would go and they would look at this palm and say, well, that's way too big to collect. I'll just take a fruit. And over time, they collected hundreds and hundreds of fruits from this palm from different parts of Africa, and each one of them was different. And what happened was that each one of them was then given its own species name, even though they all came basically from the same palm. And if you go and stand in front of that palm, you can say, well, there's that species, that species, that species, that, all on one tree. 
Of course, that's very confusing. And now, because people are able to travel more widely, and also because we're able to look at specimens that have been collected from different parts of the world, we're better able to understand the limits of where a species occurs, and which, uh, which species are good, and which species should be subsumed as synonyms. If you're ever looking for a way of finding out the current name, probably the best way is to go online. There's a page that's operated by the Royal Botanic Gardens Q and the Missouri Botanical Gardens uh, called The Plant List. The Plant List is constantly being updated, so it's not always correct, but it's as near correct as you can get. And it has two of the world's biggest botanical gardens backing it up. So searching there is a good way of finding a name and finding out which one is current. But because scientists are continually working, they're continually finding new plants, they're continually re-looking at plants that they've known for a long time, names keep changing. And there will never be a, it's done, it's finished. So I have no idea how those people on Star Trek with their little uh, device just kind of scan a plant and then get immediately get the correct name for it, because that would imply that scientists have just stopped looking, and that seems highly unlikely. I'm sorry, maintained by who? Uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens Q and the Missouri Botanical Garden. But there are other people, people involved with it too. I think New York might be in on it as well. What was the second one? The Missouri Botanical Garden. I was about to say my question might not be relevant, but this kind of tunes in. I was just kind of curious how machine learning and AI is sort of changing plant ID, especially for like field workers and people that have to do a lot rapidly. Well, <clears throat> one of the things that I do in my free time is I do plant ID for an online plant ID service. So it's an app that people can download. They can upload photos of plants, usually a house plant or something in their yard, but it might be something out in the wild. And I try and ID it. Now, I understand that what they're actually doing is sucking the knowledge out of my brain so that they can have a computer that will then be able to identify plants from photos. At the moment, the computer can't do it. And the reason is the photo's bad. Um, they haven't focused in on the particular plant parts that are important. Some plants, if you don't see the flower, you, never, you will never be able to identify it. But ultimately, with people like me giving our knowledge to the internet, I assume that AI will eventually catch up with us, and we will get to the point um, where we can identify things from a, a, a good visual image. But also, um, it's not an area that I work a lot in at the moment, but um, there is a process called DNA barcoding. And what scientists have been trying to do is to find a handful of DNA regions that can be compared across all living things. That's pretty difficult. If you're trying to compare a palm tree with an amoeba, they don't share an awful lot of genes. And so trying to find a few little bits of DNA that will cover that whole swathe is difficult, but it is happening. And as people accumulate more and more of what they call DNA barcodes, that whole device in the hand that can scan the DNA is coming closer and closer. But um, it's not going to happen before I retire. So. Thank, you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, when you came out earlier and met with the interpreters, you probably saw that as you were speaking, they were interpreting, right, mm -hmm. uh, to me. And so, at the beginning of your lecture, you imparted that the, the choice to use Latin as a central language is so that everybody can understand. And so a lot of what happens in interpretation to sign language becomes symbolic instead of linguistic. Mm -hmm. And so there are, you know, there are pockets of STEM ASL or sign language communities globally mm -hmm. that are trying to keep up with the vocabulary to make sure that it's consistent with the taxonomy. And I'm wondering if you're aware of any particular global authorities that do include the deaf community in that project. I'm afraid I'm not. And part of the reason why uh, people did not take into account that specific issue was that uh, when people were uh, trying to decide what language to use, they didn't just try, uh, they didn't uh, go through it as a process to find the most useful language. The Latin names of plants evolved from schol scholastic use of Latin. Because scholarship, in the way we understand it today, university education in many ways began in parts of Europe where the educated people were the priests who spoke Latin. Um, 
it was a natural progression from using Latin in the uh, liturgy to using it in the university. And many uh, early centers of higher education were linked to the church. Um, over time, uh, scholars began to appreciate the value of some of the older uh, published works that were available from ancient times. And so again, they realized that for their students to be able to understand them, they would have to be able to speak Latin. So while Latin is useful as a language for international communication because it's uh, not a language that anybody speaks, it wasn't chosen for its uh, utility. It just naturally evolved from the use of Latin in church and in university. Um, of course, the people who were kind of making these decisions weren't thinking about all the instances where it might not be super useful. And I know many, many gardeners curse the day that Latin was selected as a uh, language for, uh, for science. But um, on the plus side, I find it's one of the very few things that I can use when I'm traveling internationally to speak to people who speak languages that are radically different from my own. While people in Europe and North America who speak Spanish or English have the advantage that their language has a base in Latin at some point, if you're traveling in China or in India or in the Pacific, their languages are not from a Latin base. And the Latin names are often the only words that you have in common. If you read any Chinese botanical works, you will scan all the way through and you will see the Latin names. And it's a point of community. It's something that we have together and that we share. And it's one of the great benefits for science that we are able to uh, communicate across countries and uh, across the world. And Latin, though we're slightly privileged that it began in Europe, it's become so much more and has adopted words and uh, other parts of other languages too. So it's, it's evolved beyond the Latin of Rome. Um, it's a completely different thing now, but it still has its downsides. And I can understand that it would be very difficult to translate it in some ways and for some uh, vocabularies, and particularly for people who uh, use different alphabets to the Roman alphabet that we use here. But unfortunately, I'm not aware of any overall standard authority that um, guarantees the correct translation of Latin names into sign language or other, um, other languages. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, speaking of gardeners cursing and seeing it as a form of torture, who is responsible for changing the genus names from, say, Sedum to Hylotelphium, Dicentra to Lamprocampnus? There, I think it's more and more. There is no single authority. So it's not that there is a group or a panel or an expert somewhere who just makes that decision. One taxonomist can come along and change it, and another can come along and change it back. <laughs> a lot of the changes that have occurred recently have occurred as our technology has improved. So we're now able to look at the DNA of plants, and that has shown us that actually almost everything that we knew before was correct. It's amazing how much of the taxonomy that was based on just looking at dry plants has proven to be correct. But of course, it's the ones that change that confuse everybody. So tomato changing its name, losing dicentra. There are a lot of instances where a commonly known garden plant has to change name. And the way that taxonomists look at it is this. It's not just a label. It may be a label to the user, but to us, it means so much more. It implies relationship and evolution. We're trying to use those names to show that this plant is related to this plant, but not so related to this plant. And it's important, therefore, that our names reflect the evolutionary history that we have uncovered through DNA and other methods. So I'm really sorry, and I know it always drives gardeners mad, but we don't just do it to toy with you, honest. What is the meaning of the word sativa? Uh, I've seen it used as a species name for many plants, not just cannabis, and I'm wondering if there are any mm -hmm. other frequently used species names that you can sativa is Sativa is one of the, the commonest plant names, and I'm going to read it to you because otherwise I will get it wrong. So, And I don't get much of an opportunity here to actually read from the book, and this is kind of <laughs> all about the book. So, 
your S. Sativas, cultivated, as in Castania sativa. So the reason why you see it so familiarly, so commonly, is because it just means cultivated. And so a lot of the plants that are important to human beings have sativa in their name. Um, Castania sativa being the European chestnut, um, and there are many, many others. Uh, certain names are much more common than others. Any name that has a reference to do with how the plant is used is generally quite common. So Arvensi, meaning of the field, is a very, very common one. You find that a lot. Um, Vulgari is another one. Literally, it means vulgar, but it means common. So if you see something that has the name Vulgari, it's the common form. Um, but there are a lot of names that are used very, very widely and have a, a very basic uh, name like that. And it's kind of one of the good things about Latin that you can reuse names because, you know, it's difficult enough to learn them as it is without having to have an entirely new one every time. Are you done with me? <laughs> I've got one quick question, um, hopefully quick. We have a um, yeah, sure. We have a we have a, uh, a evergreen tree on our property that we've struggled to identify. Mm -hmm. um, it is it has some very sharp down facing needles. Uh, I don't expect you to identify it from that sloppy description, but we've ruled out a lot of common. Pacific Northwest trees, it's not dug fir, it's not a spruce, it's not a hemlock. What, what do you suggest we do to try and identify it? The um, Center for Urban Horticulture in Seattle has an excellent service whereby you can send in photos or actual plant material and they'll identify it for you. I used to volunteer there, so I was, and I still sometimes get the emails of their uh, pictures if the herbarium manager isn't sh quite sure what it is. So get in touch with them, send them an email that includes good photos of the plant material and any description that you need to add. It's funny, people don't think when they're sending in pictures that a little picture like this, you might not realize it's a tree. If they focus really far in on, on the leaves, you might not know it's a tree. So descriptive information, height, size, um, where you got it, that's geography is often crucially important. Things like that, send it into her and she will uh, identify it. Alternatively, get the app. Um, <laughs> Plant Compass, it's a very good app, but I would say so. Um, we are pretty good at identifying plants from photos. Um, Cheers. Plant Compass, yes. We're done. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all so much for coming. Books are for sale.